Friends, the Lord be with you. Welcome to our worship service of Holy Communion on this, uh, the ninth Sunday after Pentecost in the season of the Spirit. Um, the theme of the Gospel this morning is that Mark reveals that Jesus as Messiah is Lord of creation. In the feeding of the 5,000 and walking on the water, Jesus shows that he is the Messiah of creation. Let us stand as we sing out in hymn number 201. Guide me, O thou grateful Lord. Guide me, O satisfy the needs of every creature. Well, welcome again, dear friends. It's lovely to have you with us here this morning on this beautiful, hot, sunny morning uh, in the summer. Let us turn to page one as we greet one another. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God, now and forever. Amen. 
Hallelujah, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. We declare together the glory of the hymn of praise, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you. We give you thanks. We praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. We turn to the bulletin as we pray the collect for the ninth Sunday after Pentecost as we pray together. O God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, Increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal, that we lose not the things eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated as uh, Mr. King comes to read to us the first reading from Second. Second King, chapter four, verse forty-four to verse forty-two to forty-four. Abin came from Bel Salisa, praying who from the first foot to the bain of Gaul, twenty loaves of barley, and fresh ear of grain in his sack. Elisha said, "Give it to the people." And let them eat. But his servant said, "How can I set this before a hundred people?" So he repeated, "Give it to the people. Let them eat. For us, say the Lord, they shall eat and have some left." He set it before them. <coughs> they ate and have some left. According to the word of law, this is the word of law. Thanks be to God. Thank you, King. Let us turn to the psalm on page two. As we do, we say it from side to side by whole verse, beginning on this side. All your works praise you, O Lord, and your faithful servants bless you. That the peoples may know of your power. And the glorious splendor of your kingdom. The Lord is faithful in all His words and merciful in all His deeds. The eyes of all wait upon you, O Lord, and you give them their food in due season. The Lord is righteous in all His ways and loving in all His works. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Henry did warn me that he may not make it this morning. Um, so, would someone like to read the epistle reading for us? This The second reading is taken from epistle. The epistle reading is taken from Ephesians, chapter three, verses fourteen to twenty-one. 
I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Let us stand as we sing our gradual hymn, number 359, the tune is 607. Jesus calls us o'er the tumult. According to St. John, chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him, because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. And Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now, the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. 
One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? And Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. They filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Now when Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. And when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. And when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea, and coming near the boat. And they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. And then they wanted to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat reached the land towards which they were going. This is the Gospel of the Lord. May we pray. Uh, this morning we thank you, Lord, as we have reflected on your fatherhood to us, that you are a caring uh, and competent and capable uh, Father. And we ask, Lord, that you would strengthen our faith, that day by day we may put our trust in you. In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated, dear friends. Well, welcome. It's lovely to see you this morning. Henry, you nearly made it. Bad luck. <laughs> we were hoping for you, but never mind. Uh, Freddie did a wonderful job. Yes, lovely reading. Thank you, Freddie. So, um, let, it, uh, let us turn uh, in, in the bulletin to the outline. What have I done with that? Uh, the outline for the sermon as we finish the series on the fatherhood of God. It's on page 17. And I don't think I need to go over all the outline from the previous weeks again for you this morning. We, we looked at the idea of the fatherhood of God particularly how it is influenced by our own fathers, for good or ill. Some of us had fathers who were reliable and caring and consistent and trustworthy and so forth. And uh, others had fathers who, were, who we felt were less than adequate. It's been an interesting series for me because I've had a lot of feedback from uh, some people, especially the young people, um, about their fathers. And uh, I think there's a tendency that we wish that our fathers were, were perfect or, or superman. And of course, sometimes I hear young people and they'll be, they'll be criticizing their fathers. And I don't hear much compassion in what they're saying. They, sorry, young people can be very harsh judges sometimes uh, of their parents. Um, I remember when I was a teenager, I was quite a harsh critic of my mother and uh, felt that she was too strict and so forth. And then I went away to be an exchange student in America for a year when I was 16. And I stayed with a family and I saw many families that uh, I hadn't seen or experienced before, uh, sort of dysfunctional families. And I stayed with a family where there was a lot of anger and even violence. And, and I, I realized that actually my parents were pretty fantastic. Uh, but when I, when I went away, you know, I, I thought that they weren't so great. So if you want your children to know how great you are, send them away. <laughs> That's my advice. <laughs> um, children can be very harsh critics. Uh, at the same time, uh, we know from our own experience, looking back in retrospect, that our, our parents are, are only human and that often they, they did their best in difficult circumstances to raise us and to care for us. And as we get older, we have more compassion. But certainly we can look to our Heavenly Father as uh, a standard uh, of fatherhood for us. 
And we've talked about the compassion and care of the Father. We've talked about the consistency of our Heavenly Father, that he is faithful and he keeps his promises uh, and his love is changeless to us. We've also reflected on the frustration that sometimes when we pray, our, our Heavenly Father doesn't say yes, sometimes he says no, sometimes he seems to say wait, and sometimes he doesn't seem to say anything and we, and we wonder what's going on and whether he's asleep like Jesus in the boat. Nevertheless, a part of my job is to proclaim the, the testimony of Scripture. And the testimony of Scripture is that God is all of these things. That even though sometimes he seems to be asleep in the, in the back of the boat, and yet the Scripture declares that the Lord is close by, our third point last week, that he is never too busy for us, he loves to meet our needs, and he is sympathetic to our hurts. He cares for us and is consistently faithful. And we believe these things and declare these things, even though sometimes it's hard in life to hold on to them. Well, uh, this morning we come to the final close. And uh, I don't know about you, I'm always happy when uh, a little series comes to an end, or a lot, even more when a long series comes to an end. Uh, but the fourth point and the final point in the series is that God is a capable or competent father. God is capable or competent. Um, and this is very hard to hold on to sometimes uh, when we have a situation like with Ellis where we pray for things and the Lord doesn't seem to answer our prayers. And yet I, I think we have to put things into context that actually if the Lord was to have raised Ellis, it would have been a miracle on a par with raising Jesus from the dead because, you know, as we know, he's profoundly uh, brain damaged or perhaps raising Lazarus from, from the dead. So it was an enormous thing uh, that we asked for. And yet we could do nothing else but ask because, uh, you know, he is still with us and, uh, and we, we want the best for him. But I, I ultimately, I believe that God is close by Ellis. I believe that God is compassionate to Ellis. I believe that God is capable to raise him if he chose to. But I, I believe that he, he is simply choosing not to sometimes answer uh, our prayers. I think sometimes God does not wind back uh, the laws of nature. Sometimes he does uh, for his purposes and to, to, to demonstrate the nature of his kingdom to us, but sometimes he doesn't seem to answer uh, our, our most uh, heartfelt prayers in times of distress. And actually, it would be a lot to ask. We do ask sometimes for a lot. Um, which is perhaps beyond uh, the natural law. But I believe that Ellis is uh, in God's care and that God is capable to care for him both now and in eternity. And I believe that that's also true for us. And I, and I think this kind of series, this reflecting on Ellis' situation in this series in the last year has brought me back to the eternal truths that ultimately we are cast uh, into the everlasting arms. We, we pray for friends who have dementia to be healed and they continue to, to go along as they were or even to decline. We, we pray for the, the dead to be raised, as it were. And it doesn't always happen, obviously. Most of the time, it doesn't. And yet we believe that we are cast onto the everlasting arms. We believe that ultimately God is faithful, that God's faithfulness is great, as the song says, and that ultimately all things will be well in him. I believe that nevertheless that at times God does intervene in the natural order or in our sinful lives to do wonderful things. We know that people who have been lost have been found. We know that people who have been sick have been healed. We know that God turns around lives and that many wonderful things happen in the economy of God. We know that he can handle any problems that we bring to him, that nothing is beyond his ability or his resources. This is different to our human fathers. Um, sometimes we, we wish that our father was um, MacGyver, you know, can fix anything, but instead our father is Homer Simpson. Or we wish that our father was a superman and instead uh, our father is, is a humble dad. Uh, there's an old joke about two kids who are boasting in the schoolyard. And one kid said, my daddy can beat your daddy. And the other kid said, ah, that's nothing. My mum can beat your daddy. 
But nobody can beat our Heavenly Father. The Bible says in Luke 1.37 that nothing is impossible with God. So we keep praying for impossible things. We, uh, as Christians, we are Easter people. We keep praying for resurrections. We keep hoping for God to do wonderful things. And ultimately, we believe in the first resurrection and we look forward to our own resurrection in Christ. And we have this sure hope and foundation standing on the hist historicity of the first resurrection of Christ. We believe that nothing is impossible uh, with God. Maybe when you were small, you might have believed that your dad could fix anything. You might have thought your dad could fix the weather. You might have thought your dad could fix the TV or anything. I remember when I was a kid, we, at a Christmas time, my mum would make Christmas puddings. And she would put sixpences and threepences, the silver coins, into the puddings. You can't put the modern coins because they're not made of silver anymore. So they have toxic chemicals. And we would eat our pudding and we would get a sixpence or a threepence and then mum would exchange it for whatever the current rate was in Australian dollars at the time. And uh, invariably, while we were eating our, our pudding and having our sixpences and threepences, dad would suddenly go, mm, mm, mm. Mm. It happened every Christmas, and out would come a $50 note. We never could figure out how he did it. We never saw any sleight of hand. We never saw the $50 note go in. But every Christmas, Dad got a $50 note out of a, out of a, a mushy pudding, and it was always dry and pristine. And I thought that my dad could do anything. And then, of course, the day came when one day he himself was lying on the hospital bed with prostate cancer, and his lifeblood was seeping out uh, into the bag by the bed. And I realized that he couldn't do anything. And that we had to put our trust in our Heavenly Father, that one day I would see my earthly father again in heaven. So um, sometimes our dad is just doing their best, and very often that's the case. He doesn't actually know the answer. He, um, sometimes we ask our dads amazing things and he just gives us his best guess. But our Heavenly Father really does know the answers. He really can do anything. I do believe that in spite of the prayers that are not answered and the challenges of life, I continue to believe that God can do anything. Ephesians 3.20 says, God is able to do far more than we would ever dare to ask or even dream infinitely beyond our highest prayers or desires or thoughts or hopes. And so this Wednesday, again, our prayer team, instead of meeting at their normal venue, will go to the hospital and we will continue to pray for the impossible. If you think of the biggest goals of your life, God can think of something better. If you think of the greatest dreams that you can have, God may have a better dream. If you think of the biggest problems you have faced or you could ever come across, God can solve them. If you think of the greatest hurt you've ever felt, God can soothe it. God can handle it all. He is your heavenly father. He is close, consistent, competent, capable, caring. And if you trust him, I think that things will go better in your life. I do believe that. It's not that everything will be perfect, but I believe that the Lord helps us along the journey. So here this morning, I have a question for you. What have you been doubting that God can handle? The situation that you're in right now, that you're stressed about, and you think, I don't think God can handle this. I need to do this alone. I'm going to do this myself. I don't know about you, but in my life, I con constantly have the experience that if you want it done right, you've got to do it yourself. Um, in, in many situations in life, I will delegate and delegate and then I think, ah, oh, I should have done it myself. Of course, if we do that, then other people don't learn and they don't grow. Um, and, and often we, we think that about the troubles that we face in life or the needs we have or the challenges. And we think, I need to do this one on my own. I'm going to have to pull strings. I'm going to have to manipulate behind the scenes. I can't really trust God with my problems or my children or, or my future. And so we think we can handle something that God cannot handle. But actually, our faith tells us to drop these things into the everlasting arms, to leave them to God, 
to let him handle it. When we are exasperated with our children or with our job or with our life situation or whatever it is, our unemployment or our sickness or our trouble, the bottom line is that we are in God's hands and that he can take care of us, body and soul. And I believe that he does when we trust him. So often he comes uh, when we need him. Of course, his time is not our time. The check that we need comes just at the right moment. It doesn't always come when we want it to come. The help that we need comes just in God's timing. It doesn't always come when we want it to come. But I want to affirm today that I believe that God takes care of his children. We have seen his provision again and again and again in our lives, in the lives of those who love him. Now, many people in the world think that everyone is a child of God, and this applies to everybody. But the Christian faith doesn't say that everyone is a child of God. We are all part of the family of man. We all have DNA, which makes us literally all cousins. We literally all are, are cousins or brothers and sisters with one ancestral female that unites us all. Apparently, that's literally been proven to be true through this mitochondrial DNA business. But we are not all God's children. We have to become children. And you become children through a relationship with a parent. Some of us may have been conceived by a father that we never met. There are children who are orphans or abandoned. Someone may be your father by birth or creation, but not your father by relationship. Or maybe your father procreated you and then left the scene. We have a number of young people in our youth group whose fathers brought them into the world and then abandoned them. And they have grown up without fathers. Or they've grown up with distant fathers or divorced fathers. And they pay a price for it. They lack having been fathered. And you find them in a mess and you wonder why. And you find that there was no one there along the way guiding them, holding their hand and telling them what was right. Maybe they knew what was right, but they needed a father to guide them. And maybe they needed a father to frighten them sometimes and to challenge them and so forth. In the scripture, God says that he has created all of us. We are all part of the family of man. But we are not children of God except by relationship with God. Now, there are two ways that we can become children of God. Um, in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So today is really a kind of simple gospel message. Jesus said, goes on and he says, if you really knew me, you would know the Father as well. By knowing me, you know the Father. He said, this is why I have come, to show you the Father, so you can come to God. In Galatians 3.26, Paul writes, we are the children of God, not through being religious, not through going to church, not by keeping the commandments, but we are the children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. This is the only way that we come into God's family and become children of God. It's through a relationship of faith. And faith means we need to trust that God is compassionate, consistent, close and capable, even when the storm is raging around and he seems to be asleep at the wheel. I remember when I was a teenager and I was an exchange student in America and I was staying with a United Methodist uh, host family. And we went to the summer youth conference on, on a farm in upstate New York. It was very idyllic, really, looking back. And we had our meetings in an old farm barn. It was wonderful. There was bales of straw around and all the youth would be there. And they brought in two young evangelists from the United Methodist Church. And they, they preached the gospel. Now, you need to understand the United Methodist Church is a bit like the Anglican Church. It was a very traditional liturgical church with priests and bishops and so on and had a very traditional approach to baptizing infants into the faith. And so almost all the youth who were at this gathering of 150 teenagers had all come into the church through their parents. They'd all been baptized as babies. They'd all grown up in the church. And for the first time in their lives, uh, because the United Methodist Church is fairly liberal, they heard evangelists. They were from their own denomination, but they were evangelists. And they said to the young people, you are not a Christian simply because you are physically born into a Methodist family. You have to choose to follow Jesus and to have faith in Christ. 
And for me, this made sense because growing up in the Anglican Church in Australia, I'd heard this message that one must believe in Jesus and be born again. But it was fascinating that these 150 young United Methodists had never heard this. They'd never heard the gospel. They never heard that you needed to be evangelized as well as sacramentalized. They never, they never understood that it's not enough to be born as a human child into the church um, through Christian parents, but you need to make a decision for yourself at some point. And they all were actually, the reaction was so fascinating because the vast majority of them were offended. Now, the evangelists were not Bible-thumping, offensive, rude, or insensitive, or fundamentalist. They were just simply saying, you need to choose to believe in Christ for yourself. And almost universally, the young people were angry and offended. I was astonished. I was really astonished. They had no concept that they personally needed to have a faith in Christ, that they needed to add to their baptism their own faith. They didn't have that concept. It's fascinating. And they were so angry. And after the meeting over our hot chocolate, they were all sitting around gossiping and slandering the evangelists and saying how terrible it was that the denomination had brought in these people. It was really amazing. And, and I was trying to discuss with them and say, but actually, maybe they're right, you know. Maybe we do need to believe for ourselves. It's not enough that we are born. In. It offended their pride. It offended their pride to suggest that something needed to be added to their birthright, their, their baptismal birthright, that they actually needed to add faith to their sacrament of baptism. There, there are two human ways to get into a family. You can be born in a family or adopted in the family. And in the scripture, both metaphors are used to coming into the Christian family. You can be born or you can be adopted. But when it says born, it's not referring to physical birth. Our birth into the Christian family is not from our mom and dad. It's our spiritual birth. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born of the water and the spirit. You have to be born spiritually from on high, from above, born again. So these kids had confused it. And they thought that you could either come into the Christian family through believing as an adult and being adopted into the family, or you could be actually born a Methodist and then you are by definition therefore always and forever a Christian. You understand? But actually, both of those ideas, birth and adoption, are metaphors. You know that, I think, but they didn't know that. And that fascinated me, that such a large group of teenagers was so, had, was so misconceived, that they had misunderstood that the birth into the family of God is not a literal physical birth through your earthly mother, but it's a spiritual birth. And that both birth and adoption are metaphors that say we are not born children of God. We have to become children of God through spiritual birth, believing in Jesus, uh, and that this is the way to the Father. This is the way uh, to relationship with God. So, you see, to be a child of God, you have to have relationship with God. So a lot of people in the world think, well, we all, we're all children of God. That's a kind of common sentiment. But actually, we're not. You're not a child of Jehovah, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, unless you have a relationship with him. And the only way you can have a relationship, according to the scripture, is through the Son, through being adopted as a sibling together with Jesus. It's through the Son that we come into the family and are born again spiritually by the indwelling Holy Spirit and the sanctification, forgiveness of our sins, the washing of the water of baptism, we are born into the family of God and adopted into the family of God. And we talk about these things at our, at our baptism. At the second service day, if you have time, you may not want to come for the testimonies, or you may. I think we'll have two interesting testimonies today. One about prayer and the importance of small group fellowship and prayer and the other about the conversion of a girl who grew up in communist China and of her heartfelt search to find Jesus in the Bible. It's a very humorous and touching story, I think. Um, so come and hear the testimonies if you have time at the second service. But the youth are going to do a dance to a contemporary song called Amen. And it's really powerful. And it's a song about baptism, but it doesn't sound like it. When you hear it, it's like a funky contemporary song. When you watch it and you listen to the words, you realize it's an Easter song about baptism. And it's a tremendous experience to see them dance to this. So if you can come, come and hear the song. We need to be born through the water of baptism. And in the song, there's a video. You know, it's one of these, um, all the songs today have a video, right? 
And the videos are often more interesting than the songs because uh, the art of the video is so amazing now, right? And in this song, Amen, it speaks of the water of baptism and it speaks of the resurrection and of dry bones coming to life. And you see these two men walking through a desert. So it's the imagery of these men and they're in the desert and there's the dry bones on the ground and, and then you see them begin to run and they're running and then you see them falling into this great ocean of water and it's their baptism, you know, they're, they're, they're fresh water. So they come from the desert into the water and then they come out and they continue their journey together. So it's, it's like Pilgrim's Progress. It's a kind of metaphor of the Christian life. And then at the end, they see a ship on the horizon. And I don't know what they thought it meant, but in, in traditional Christian symbolism, the ship represents the church. And interestingly, there's a, there's a fire, there's a brazier on the ship. There's a fire burning on the ship. You can see the smoke. So it's a, a, a church and there's a fire in the belly of the, of the ship. So the song is, is very moving, but it, it speaks of this image of new birth through the water and the spirit. It's very powerful. I really encourage you to come if you can. And, um, and also come for lunch. Come and enjoy the lunch that we'll have. So um, either way, whether you, you say, well, I, I, well, when we become a Christian, of course, we are both born again and we are also adopted into God's family. First Peter 1.3, God has given us the privilege of being born again so that we are now members of God's own family. And Ephesians 1.5, God's unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his family by sending Jesus to die for us. So when we uh, believe in Jesus, we are born again and we are adopted through Christ into his family. Either way, we have to come to God through Jesus. John 1, 12, to those who believed in him, who received him, he gave the right to become children of God. I know that you are here this morning because you are the faithful remnant, but I encourage you not to miss this truth, that whatever kind of Christian you are, you are no kind of Christian if you have not believed in Christ and been born again, if you have not knelt at the feet of the Savior. Last night at youth group, Enya taught the kids about surrender, and she taught, told them that it's not enough to believe in Jesus. We ha it's not enough. At some point, we have to come and kneel and surrender. And she talked about surrendering our time and our desires and our preferences and, and how we want to control things. But following Christ means surrender. It means seeking first his kingdom. It means putting first his priorities and not our priorities. It means saying to God, I want you to be the manager of my life. So as we conclude this series... Uh, of the fatherhood of God. I want to invite you afresh into a relationship with God as a father. And perhaps you're already there, or perhaps you've never thought about it, that God is not only in Christ your Savior and your Lord and your friend, but he is your loving father. He is compassionate and caring. He is consistent, faithful and true. He is closer by than you think. The Old Testament says he's nearer to us than our clothing. He is capable and competent to help us. I once read of a study of 50 of the most famous atheists in the world. And the one thing that they had in common was all, they all had a bad relationship with their fathers. They all resented or hated their fathers. I don't think that's an accident. I think there is a connection between our paternal relationship and our capacity to understand the nature of God as a loving Father. So perhaps as we draw this series to a conclusion, we can all reflect on our parental... I think we all have parental relationship with others. Even if we don't have children, we all mentor people, or we're aunties, or we're uncles. We influence people. And sometimes I think of how I've influenced people not for the best. Or I think of how, at times, I've lost my temper when I shouldn't have. Or at times, I haven't been as faithful as I should have. And I know that that will impact those who are watching. There are always younger ones watching us, whether they are our own children or other people's children who didn't have fathers and mothers. There are always people watching, and they pay attention. Last night at youth group, one of the leaders, a young adult, said to me, 
You know, recently um, I, I've been thinking, I don't want to come to church. And this person said to me, I always have this reason or that reason. And I feel sick or I don't want to do this or do that. And I, and I find excuses not to come to church. And then she said to me, a very touching thing. She said, I thought of you. And she said, I've known you for seven or eight years. And she said, I can't ever remember you not coming to church because you were sick. And I think that's true. I may have not been well, but if I was really raging infectious, I wouldn't come. Um, but it's true. And I, and I was really touched that, because normally kids are not that thoughtful. You know, normally they don't pay attention. But actually, I think one of the things that taught me is they pay attention more than we think. That they, they do watch us. And, and they may not be your natural children, but other people look to you as an example and a mentor. And they see how Christians are behaving. And in us, they see God. They see the compassion of God. They see the consistency of God. They see the closeness and the intimacy of God. They see the capability and the competence of God. So maybe that's an encouraging note to end on. I, I believe that people will watch you and they will learn from you about the character of God. And whether God is ultimately kind and good and merciful. So let us all strive to be loving, compassionate, consistent, close, caring, capable and competent for others. Uh, that we may reflect the Father to those around us. And let us also renew our relationship and our faith in the Father and our trust that God loves us and that we are held in the everlasting arms. Let us pray. Just take a moment to reflect. How is your relationship with your heavenly Abba, your dad? You know he is your dad. When we are little, there is nothing sweeter than to fall asleep in the arms of the Father. To rest in the everlasting arms. Lord, this morning we want to thank you for your everlasting arms. Faithful, close, consistent, caring and capable to save. Mighty to save. We thank you that your arms uphold us and enfold us, always, come what may. And we ask that we may be good examples to the young people around us, that we may reflect your care, your consistency, your kindness, your wisdom, your closeness to them, and your competence. In your name we pray. Amen. I want to just close with another little story. That I had a, The youth group was great yesterday. We had about 30 kids there and there were a lot of great things that happened. One of the great things that happened is I sat in on a small group, discussion group, and there was a girl in the group and I, I thought that she was about 13. It turned out that, and she's been coming, but then she stopped coming for a while, so I didn't know her very well. And then she came back and... And I discovered that she's 17 and she's in Form 5 at MAC. And, um, and we were talking about this issue of surrender. And we asked them the question, you know, for people who don't go to church or don't go to youth group or don't care to know about God or follow God, why do you think that is? What excuses do they come up with? Or why is it that they don't want to go? And she shared, it was very interesting, she shared how... Um, she's from a sort of nominally Catholic family, but she shared how her friends at school all make fun of her for going to youth group and her girlfriends. And the girlfriends will go for coffee on Saturday because they're in Form 5. And they will mock her and say, you know, come with us. Why are you going to youth group? And they'll say to her, what is there that you can't find with us having coffee? What do you have there? And she finds it very hard to tell them. And, and, I, and I said, so I said to her, what do you, why, why do you, what's the answer to the question? Why do you come to youth group? And, and she, the reason she'd stopped coming for six months was because of teasing, because of being mocked. 
for going to youth group. And they, they think that people who go to youth group are weirdos, you see. And um, they don't understand. And, and actually, we have a lot of fun. It's very meaningful. And it's a wonderful time that we have. And she said, she thought about it and she said, she said, when I get with my girlfriends and we have coffee, all we do is gossip and waste time. She said, when we come to youth group, we have a good time and we learn things and, and we grow and we learn about God. And she said, I only have one life and I don't want to waste it. She said, I want to be the best person I can be. And, and I think I can be a better person by coming to youth group. Now, this is not a child from an, ev an evangelical family or a, a card-carrying Christian family. She's from a very nominal, very nominal, you know, Christmas and Easter Catholic family. I oh, wasn't that amazing, you know, and I thought, wow, you're definitely not 13, you know. Yeah. It's definitely, this is so much maturity, you know, coming out from this child. And, and she said, no, she said, I don't want to go and waste my life gossiping and drinking coffee. She said, I want to come here and, and, and learn about God. And she said, they don't understand. But she said, I, I, I realized, I decided, I'm going to come. I don't care what they say. Isn't that wonderful? So hang in there. You never know, you know. You never know what's going on in the people you influence. You never know the impact that you're having for good. I never would have dreamed. Let us turn to page four, as we do. And we stand and declare our faith in the words of the creed. We say with those around the world this morning, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scripture. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Please be seated or kneel as you feel comfortable as Anya comes to lead us in our intercessions. Uh, this morning, can we turn to page 32, uh, form 4? Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory to the world. We especially pray today for the Friendship Sunday, uh, for mo uh, moving testimonies and meaningful encounters with God among the congregation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the, of the, all the nations in, the, in your ways uh, of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours, and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another with compassion as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. As always, we pray for Ellis, but we also pray for his family, that they have a good rest this week, and then we are guided by the Lord in how we can gather around them and support them. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We command to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled, 
and, that, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, hear the prayers of your people. And what we have asked for in faith, grant that we may obtain in faith to the glory of your name, through Christ our Lord. Hear the words of the Lord as we prepare our hearts to break bread together. Jesus said, Come to me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We confess our sins against God and our neighbor as we pray together, Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive what we have been, amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Dear friends, hear these words of absolution. May Almighty God have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. May we stand for the greeting of peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us greet one another with the uh, elbow bump of peace. <laughs> Um, yeah, we have uh, two more Sundays today and next week to sign up for CAM, and um, we've taken the liberty of putting the application form again in the bulletin. Just want to continue to encourage people to come. Um, on page seven, there are some statistics about how we're going. So far, we have 104 people signed up. That doesn't mean 104 people will be there at the opening. Um, those 104, 67 are full overnight campers, and that includes 24 rooms, 62 adults, 11 toddlers, 14 primary children, 17 teenagers, uh, 10 Sunday campers, and 18 coming for church lunch. Uh, there's a bunch more people who told me they're going to sign up for church lunch or for Sunday only. So um, we'll continue to uh, keep track, and we're hoping that we can get more than 120 people to come on the camp. There is some new information about the camp. You have to turn um, right over. Hold on a second. Uh, let me get my other bulletin that I've highlighted. There's some news about the camp situation. On page 12, just a small thing. Um, some folks have said to me they think they can do better by booking it themselves. If you can, you're most welcome. Just read the notice there on page 12. I don't think you can at this stage. Uh, maybe you could have two months ago. Um, but, you know, the closer you get, the more the hotel puts up the price. So I think at this stage you won't get a better deal than what, what we're offering. Um, and it explains also uh, how to do that or whatever. So also there's an upgrade. Instead of giving us a free breakfast, the hotel is going to give each room a 500 mop food and beverage credit. Um, so this means that if, for example, if there's a single mother with two children, she only has to pay for one breakfast because for children uh, aged 0 to 5, it's free, the food is free, and for, uh, for children aged 6 to 18 in the restaurant, uh, it's also free. So if a mum, say, has two kids, then the two kids eat free and mum only has to pay for one breakfast, which is about 220. So that means she has 220 uh, mop to buy drinks by the pool. So uh, I hope that makes sense. Um, so uh, hopefully that'll be good for mum. 
uh, or buy the kids some chips or something by the pool or whatever it is. So that's a slight change. And then all the details of how that works. You can only use that credit when you're there. It's not a voucher that you can bring back next week. You can only use it at the time when, when you're there. Also, there is a deposit when you check in. So if you come, you have to check in yourself. And uh, they will have your name. We'll give them your name if you've signed up for camp. They'll find you on their register. And then you either need to use a credit card or pay a thousand cash. However, you can choose not to uh, pay a deposit. But if you choose not to pay a deposit, then when you visit the coffee shop, obviously you have to uh, pay cash. Whereas if you're um, uh, staying in a room, then you can just sign for it and pay when you check out. So the usual things apply. So uh, I commend them to you. The men's dinner is this week, but no one's actually signed up. So I don't know why, if they're watching the Olympics or what it is. So um, I hope a few people will sign up, but it's supposed to be this Thursday. Um, I also today want to especially congratulate Brian and Christine on their 58th wedding anniversary uh, this week. Can we give them a, a big clap? So, con congratulations, guys. We hope you'll have a very, very... Is it actually the 27th? Wow, wonderful. So, so we hope you'll have a really wonderful and happy anniversary together. Do you still buy each other presents? Chris and I don't do that anymore. <laughs> no, I don't think so. All right. This week, the, the Wednesday prayer meeting will be meeting in Ellis's hospital room. If you want to come and join the prayer team, uh, we have about 10 ladies and myself who, who pray on a Wednesday night for the church. If you want to come, uh, the details are there uh, in, in, the, um, in, the, in the bulletin. And the, the men's series I mentioned, we're going to be talking about a midlife crisis. It's actually a really important subject uh, that very few men understand. And, um, you know, it's fascinating to me that no one signed up because it's sort of, it's incredibly important. Um, but so far, no one's interested to come. So never mind. Say la vie. Um, let us uh, sing our offertory hymn, which is number 64, Break Thou the Bread of Life.
right in the green group. Let us pray together as we offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and make good our promises to the Most High. We pray together, yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to be flesh and be a 
Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may ever more dwell in him and he in us. The gift of God for the people of God, his body broken and his blood shed, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and let us feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Serve the body of Christ, keep you in touch with Holy Christ, keep you in touch with the body of Let's turn to page 25. They gathered up the leftovers from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten and they filled twelve baskets. And when people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Let us give thanks as we pray this prayer for the communion. We say together, Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food. 
in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. The blessing unto God's gracious mercy and protection I commit you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and those whom you love and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and those whom you love now and forevermore. Amen. Dear friends, thank you for coming today. I'm always humbled that anybody shows up. Um, it's always a joy to see you and a blessing. Thank you for coming to worship the Lord this morning. Let us sing our closing hymn, one of my favorites. Um, Number 159. Forth in thy name, O Lord, I go. 159.